evening, Sambanani Dumelang, and welcome to the Tuesday edition of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandungwa Kumalo. We're on episode 121. I don't know if I'm ever going to get over how we even got over episode 100, but we keep on going because, of course, we are your daily source of property news, property insights, whether you're a property investor, seller, buyer, or a renter. It certainly doesn't matter you know, where you are in your property journey. Well, this evening, we're going to be talking about something that I know so many of us, certainly as property investors, want to always get a better sense of. And we're looking at these five simple property principles that will ensure that you thrive in your property venture. I'm sure a lot of us, you know, we, we want to do well, of course, in our property venture. And whether you, you know, add in that first investment property or already now on property five and about to go to six and seven, you always want to make sure that you not only understand the basics and the fundamentals, but that you're able to build onto that as much as you can. Of course, I have been asking many of you if, if you attended the virtual property show, and if you did, what were some of the highlights for you? I want to hear from you. Uh, I think it was such a great weekend. I'm still going to you know, be talking about the virtual property show uh, for the next couple of days to come, even for weeks to come. And I also want to hear from you, who are some of the speakers that we had on the virtual property show that you would like us to have right here on the private property podcast? I know that some of the you know, experts we've already had here, maybe there's something they said that you think, you know what, please bring them back. We actually want to um, dig deeper into an issue that they raised during the virtual property show do drop us that message down here below and the team will certainly reach out to the experts to help us on our property journey well this evening i've got a really great guest uh, lawrence bull who is a property coach he's an author and he's the founder of my property app lawrence good evening thank you so much for joining us hi zaman tungwa thank you thank you and, and welcome to everybody that's joined on on the podcast it's great to be here so Lawrence and I were talking off air and, you know, talk, uh, started talking a little bit about languages and I, I wanted to attempt to say his name the French way, but I thought actually, <laughs> I was really... You can still give it a try if you want. Yeah. No, I think I'll not. Um, but, you know, Lawrence, I think one of the big things certainly that fears at home love, of course, is talking about property. Uh, uh, you know, I think one of the big things is it doesn't really matter where we are in our property journey. There's always something to learn. I mean, I'm a property investor. I'd like to think I'm relatively seasoned and I've been at it for a couple of years, but even I still learn quite a lot from the various guests that we have on because there really is always something to learn and to build on certainly on your property yeah. journey. And I think one of the things that we, you know, talking about this evening, of course, are these principles that you know, viewers at home are going to benefit from when they have a better understanding um, because one of the huge things that's always reiterated here on the Private Property Podcast is how property is a business and you should treat it like that. So even if you've got one investment property or you're now at that stage where you've got 10 or 20, it doesn't matter. If you, you need to just get the, you know, the basics right from property one, and that essentially helps you to scale your portfolio as much as possible. Perhaps take us through that first, you know, principle that viewers at home should be aware of um, mm. when they are, you know, running their property businesses. 100%. Well, I think, I think the key thing is, I, I want to call it a re-education in property. Um, I think a lot of us have an idea of what a property investment looks like or what a good investment looks like. And, and, and I'd like to actually challenge that. So when I first started investing, my idea was to buy a big house in Santon or Bryanston or Schlanger or Greenpoint, you know, one of those fancy areas. And I thought that if I'm a property owner of one of those blocks, I must be successful. But the reality is from a, from a cash flow monthly perspective, those are usually liabilities. A, a true yeah. asset is one where you can buy at a certain purchase price where your rent can cover not only your bond, but your rates and taxes, your levies, and you're left with a little bit of profit left over. You know, as you mentioned, this is a business and needs to be run as one. So my specific philosophy in property is the buy and hold strategy. So buy, put in the tenant, rent it out. But I need to make sure that the rent is higher than the monthly expenses and that I have some left over profit per month. And then I know that it's a good investment. So I think the first key principle is not seeing Santon as the place to invest, but seeing Berea in CBD as the place to invest, to see Joburg South, the Rosettenville, the Kenilworth, the blocks of flats as the place to invest, student accommodation as the place to invest, as opposed to the picket fence, nice house in, in a rich suburb. And it's actually, you know, and I love that that's the first sort of principle to, to explore, right? So 
re-looking what we even perceive as good investments because I think when you're growing up and you see all these great properties in different areas, we probably think, well, people who live in those houses, you know, they drive big fancy cars. And I think maybe two people, certainly before you even start running the numbers and you're doing your research, you think that's a great uh, you know, investment because mm-hmm. I know that the people who live there are moneyed people, as it were. And yet you don't necessarily understand the, you know, the, the payment uh, psychology of some of those so-called money people and and I mean I've heard so many horror stories about you know upper middle class and not paying rental on time and it's not to say that don't invest in those areas certainly not but it's to also begin to look at other areas um, as you know areas that you could potentially rent mm. possibly buy and hold or rent out and mm. also monitoring I, mean, I think Lawrence I think if I look at some of the areas that you've mentioned your Kensington um, and even the uh, I think that um, in the Joburg South there's also a few of those areas where you're able to mm. you know buy those blocks of flats or apartments that are um, you know quite priced quite well is when you look at the payment pattern of people who live in those areas it's actually so incredible because you would think that people don't make rent on time when you set it at a certain price point, but you actually find that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, Berea uh, in CBD and Hillbrow, uh, I always had the assumption that those were you know higher risk areas. And from the TPN report and the data, it actually shows that you're looking at a delinquency rate of five to ten percent, which is lower than your Bryanston suburbs. So from a payment profile point of view, spot on. Um, I think when you, you when you look at property, there's essentially two buckets, right? You've got your buy and hold. Sorry, I'm near town, so that's the motorbike in the background. The buy and hold strategy, which is all about cash flow. It's all about making sure your rent is higher than your expenses. And then you've got your flipping or your buy and sell strategies, which work really well in the Santons and the green points of the world. If you can find a rundown, distressed house, renovate it and you know, sell it above market value. But I think... That's where the education comes in is knowing what your strategy is, what area that strategy works, and then using the numbers to make an informed and educated decision instead of just hoping upon a good asset. Yeah. So then the first principle is the re-education in property. So really understanding that it isn't just about where the Joneses or the Kumalus live, but also understanding other areas where, you know, other people live and who are perhaps at a different LSM and even interrogating the TPN data. And I love, Lawrence, Mm. that you actually brought that up because we've spoken to Michelle Dickens, the MD of TPN, on a number of occasions here on the Private Property Podcast. And interrogating their data is so crucial, especially as a property investor because you shouldn't just be looking at you know how much other people are for example charging when you go to privateproperty.co.za and you look at the average but you also want to see what's been collected is it been collected on time uh, you know, what's the vacancy rate in that area so that's something that's very important so Lawrence that's the first principle what you what, what would you then say is the second principle that we should take note of yeah well the second one you, you kind of set me up perfectly there I think it's making a decision based on facts not opinions um, you know I, I do think that if you're using the likes of a lightstone report to get sales comparables and you're looking at a, a TPN report to understand your payment profiles your risk profiles your demographics your LSM you can get all of that data uh, you start making a much more informed decision mm-hmm. um, and, and this is a numbers game you know uh, the, the, you get to the end of the month and you're either making a profit or a loss and you're making X amount of return you know if you're if you're making let's say a six percent return on a property investment in year one, That's basically what you're getting if you leave your money in the bank at a 6% interest rate. But now you're taking the risk of a property. So does that risk or does that return warrant that risk? Mm -hmm. So I think when you're looking at property, it's very much a business. There's numbers. You have to balance your risk and reward scales. So I would say principle number two is use facts, not opinions. And I think the big thing when you say, you know, property is a numbers game, I I keep saying this, it the realization always hits me in different ways. So, you know, there's a property uh, a degree I'm doing. One of the courses is, you know, real estate finance, which mm. troubles me sometimes because I'm not <laughs> very big on finance. And I think one of the big things that you realize when you certainly do real estate, uh, you know, in university is property is finance. It's it's not the bricks yeah. and mortar. It's not, it's finance. So if you don't have, you know, a fundamental understanding um, in finance, you're going to struggle. So you almost need to just get used to understanding that this 
asset class you're dealing with. It's literally just finance. So yes, we the people, the relationships and all those things are important, but the very core and the fundamental of property is finance. And whether it is, you know, how you're putting together a deal, all that stuff, it's just literally the fundamentals are all in finance. So I think I always have to keep reminding myself that you're essentially (laughs) doing a finance, you know, degree. This is not, this is not a property degree. It just so happens that you're trading in property, but in essence, Mm. it's a finance degree. Um, And I'm sure many people at home out probably feeling slightly intimidated as I say that I can already assure you don't feel intimidated you know there are different resources that are able to help you um certainly calm your nerves I'll be the first person I mean I always say I don't even like excel I come from a humanities background we didn't have to do excel that much uh and so even basic excel would be a thing that I you know used to dislike but you get better at it so I I think at home don't feel discouraged to think oh god so here's this thing, it's actually just finance. I just thought I'm going to be giving people their home and I'll be able to identify deals. All that stuff is still going to happen, but be comfortable with the numbers because that's how you're going to make your returns. You want to understand the numbers as much as possible. So Lawrence, now that we understand certainly the, the facts, so we're able to make our decisions based on facts and not opinions, what would the third principle then be? I think my favorite thing about property, which is different to stocks, different to gold, different to all your different asset classes, is leverage. Um, You know, the banks love to loan on property investments. They won't loan you as for stocks and shares. They won't loan you to buy gold, but they will loan you to buy property. And I think one one of my favorite catchphrases is other people's money. And that's what works in property. For, for instance, one of the strategies that I follow is a Stockfell crowdfunding approach. So me and, and four other young professionals, we put a couple of grand into a pot every single month. And every three to four months, we buy a property with that. Um, you know, that's a great way to get started. You've got five, 10 friends, you put in a little bit of money, you buy a property together. Um, another strategy could be, um, uh, you know, uh, it's called the rent to rent strategy. I don't know if you've heard of that, Samantungwa. Rent to rent. Okay, take us through that one. I haven't heard rent to rent. I know we know we we buy unless you're talking about sub sub leasing, you know, rental space. But pretty much, pretty having, much. Okay, okay. Yeah, the concept the concept works really well in student areas and and requires almost zero financing to actually get into the property game. So, you go to an area like Brixton in Johannesburg, you can find a, a five six bedroom house rented from the landlord at let's say 10,000 Rand. And then you sublet each room to a bunch of students and you charge the students obviously higher than what you're charged at the, at the landlord. So let's say you're paying 10,000 to your landlord, but you subletting for 20,000, you're making a 10,000 Rand passive income without having to buy the property. And again, it comes back to this point of leverage. And that's why I love properties to use leverage of other people's money, other people's resources to help your financial position. And it's such an important one. I think, I, I was having a conversation uh, with my mother actually about, you know, home loans and how oftentimes one of the joys with, um, you know, home loans in particular and that facility is the ability to use that facility as a bank. And, you know, whether you're paying, let's say, extra every month and you're able to have access to that money, if you've already held onto a property for X period of years, you can now refinance that particular property or re-advance it and you now have access to even more money. That more money, you could use it to either upgrade that particular place to have more units in that yard or you can use it, you know, as down payment in other properties. So really... I think one of the big things with leverage, and and I've promised viewers at home that we'll have more, um, you know, episodes on this one because the finance part of things is usually the part that dribbles. I think a lot of us, um, even when it comes to how do you then even structure your portfolio, right? Mm. Uh, because if, for example, in your in portfolio in its entirety, you've got certain units that are yours and you've bought to hold and so you're renting them out. Perhaps there's a certain component where you're renting to rent, as you say. There's another where you've got your property stock file with some of your friends. How are you best going to then maximize your portfolio to grow? Um, how are you going to use the various incomes that you're getting um, across essentially your portfolio to 
build on other properties. Perhaps you want to get into two or three other stock files with another set of friends. Uh, perhaps you want to add more properties to buy and hold. Or maybe now you're thinking, actually, I'm liquid enough to, to do flipping, you know, um, and maybe I want to explore that. So those are certainly some of the different things that I think are so important, Lawrence, for us to have a better understanding of, because I know a lot of people get tied down with how do you strategize, certainly mm. from a financial perspective, your portfolio as much as possible. Lawrence, I wanted to take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to explore those last two principles, but I'm also going to, you know, pick your brain and get some tips for viewers at home in terms of how they can do that. Because I think one of the big things is, as I said, finance can dribble even the best of us. Uh, mm. You know, I always confess some of the financial mistakes I've made along the way. Uh, luckily, I've got a really great team, great accountant, you know, great uh, uh, um, power team, as it were, who helps me navigate my property journey. But not all of us start off like that. And I certainly didn't start off like that. Mm. And, mm. and none of us essentially start off like that. And I think it's so important that as we learn, we share it with each other. To viewers at home, I want to hear some of the you know, principles that you've picked up along the way on your own property journey what have been some of the key things that you picked up that you think you know what now that i know this it's such a valuable thing to have learned along my property journey and you certainly want to share it with us uh, here on the private property podcast we're gonna go for a quick break and we'll be back just after this Welcome back to episode 121 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantu Kumalo. This evening, we're looking at five simple property principles that will ensure that you thrive in your property venture. And I'm joined this evening by Lawrence Bull, who is a property coach and author and founder of My Property App. Now, Lawrence, we've already gone through the first three principles. The first one being you must re-educate uh, you know, yourself when it comes to property. The second is you want to make decisions that are based on facts as opposed to people's opinion and really understanding the, the you know the importance of using data to make your decision as a property investor and then the third is leverage so using other people's money to grow your property uh, portfolio what would then be the fourth principle that we should take mm. I, I think your power team as you rightfully mentioned just now is so crucial Having a vetted attorney, um, a good estate agent, having an accountant who knows the tax laws and the best structure to make sure that your business is tax efficient. Um, you know, having a good builder who can go in, project manage, and really understand what what the damp issues might be or what the what the area uh, issues within your um, environment might be. Letting a letting agent for me is critical because having the letting agent on my team who who manages the you know the the, the turnaround of tenants, who manages the renovations, who manages the evictions if those are required allows me to focus on my other business interests while my property business becomes more of a passive generating machine and that's i think that's the key for me is is property when run correctly can become a passive income stream which allows you to follow your passions and your dreams as opposed to um you know feeling like you have to work you know Lawrence, when it comes to the power team perhaps you know any tips you'd like to share on how to choose your power team uh, and let's look at somebody for example who's about to start uh, their investment journey. So you're not even necessarily uh, at that stage where you've already got a few properties under your belt and you've now got a sense of how to do this property thing because you've you know probably made a few mistakes along the way. You are now just about to probably make that first transaction or perhaps you're still just looking uh, and you want to you know buy that first investment unit. What tips would you share around building that power team? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the first thing is that there are two team members that need to be local. And what I mean by local is if you're investing in Berea, you need these two people to be in the Berea area. And those are your estate agents, letting agents, and your builders. So those are two people that need to be local or regional to your area of investment. Everybody else, your accountants, attorneys, your trusts and insurance specialists, and all of those guys can be national. You know, so they can be based in Cape Town or KZN or wherever it is and work with you, but your two local ones have to be uh, local. And then I think it's basically a vetting process, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I work with a build, I'll always ask, what were your previous projects? Give me a few numbers of your previous um people who you worked for let me see one or two of your past projects let me see the before and the after photos i think i do have a challenge as i think we all do finding quality contractors and and people yeah. to to work for um and yes i've bumped my head and numerous times i'm sure you've done the same but vetting as much as you can through um through past experiences and if you're looking at someone like an accountant you know are they registered or, or certified with the right kind of entities um so I would say those are the two kind of ideas I would have. Look, the moment you said, you know, vetting and contractors in the same sentence, I just had to <laughs> back some, all the horror experiences I previously used to have, uh, you know, before finding the, you know, the builder that I'm working with now, who's really fantastic. But it is one of those experiences mm. that you sometimes have to go through a few people. Um, you have to kiss a few frogs to get to the prince, I was right? literally about to say the same thing, <laughs> that unfortunately yeah. uh, you have to kind of go through that first. But once you do get that perfect builder, I think it's such a great relationship. I mean, there was a property that, uh, you know, my business partners and I went to go view and the builder came through and you're already able to say, if you wanted to add two extra bedrooms in the space, is it feasible? If you wanted to add yeah. like, it's, you know, um, outside uh, apartments in the yard, is it possible? How much would the cost be? You know, does what we think we want to do land itself well, even from a construction perspective? Yeah. So you're really able to already make those kind of decisions from the first day you view. You don't have to go back because you're thinking, look, your builders already advised that the numbers are going to be like this. You already calculating, do you want to go into that deal with that extra you know, money that you're going to have to put up for the construction work or if you have to fix certain things and understanding that when you're viewing for the first time becomes so important um, mm. as opposed mm. to waiting until after transfer and then you're bringing a builder in and only then realizing that actually the, the nature of the damage is so big that it's actually just going to eat into your bottom line. So yeah, that's quite exactly. a big thing. Power teams try to get it right, work with different people, get a sense. You also just begin to slowly get a sense of how you work with other people and your style of working. Mm -hmm. Because we mm -hmm. underestimate how you know property is may not necessarily be your primary job. So the way you work at work may not necessarily be how you're now going to work with this power team. So also just getting a sense of that is so crucial for you um, as a property investor even when you are starting off. And so Lawrence, then what is the final golden principle? Um, if I can put it that way. <laughs> um, uh, you know, for me, I think, I think have a trusted advisor on your team. And, and, and sometimes in, in, the, in this industry, it's called a property coach. Um, I, I do disagree with that term because I think sometimes some of the property coaches in South Africa have less properties than you do and they're trying to teach you how to invest. Uh, what I mean is if you want to, if you want to become financially free through property, go and listen and speak to someone who is financially free. The reason why Jay-Z is as successful as he is and now a billionaire is because Warren Buffett is his mentor, is his coach, is his uh, advisor. So, um, I think, you know, if that if, if I could leave you with one, one last principle is if you want to have a six pack, go to the guy in the gym that's got the six pack. <laughs> Don't go to the guy in KFC who's eating a, a bucket but tells you he knows all the secrets to a six pack. If they can't <laughs> show you the success, then don't follow them because they're not going to take you to that destination. They're going to take you to wherever they are, yeah, uh, which is the yeah. KFC in this case. All I can say is uh, we're not going to accept Umkaba slander. So if, you know, everybody who's got one, uh, I, I'm protecting you against Lawrence and, <laughs> and his comments. What I will say though, Lawrence, is because I, I get approached quite a lot, uh, you know, by various people wanting yeah. to be mentored or um, coached, as, as you put it. And 
I tend to find, and, and the, my response is pretty similar with everyone. You know, I don't have the, the time capacity uh, or the inclination really to, to go down that mm. road. But for me, it's mm. mostly about time because the nature of how consuming my work has been is that I, I don't have the time for it. So there are people who are yeah. doing that as their job. I'm already seeing some of your messages and comments. And we're going to go through some of the questions. Uh, Desiree Ramukolo, is it or Ramuko, who's saying, so grateful after knowledge sharing tips and tricks. Uh, thank you very much there, Desiree. And I think Desiree, oh, it's Ramuko. I see there's a question. Um, there's another comment that uh, Desiree shared here with us saying, love the principles. We're, me we're made to fear the CBD barrier and help, right? But now do we have to ensure the risk is, but how do we ensure rather that the risk is lower where we are being made to know that they are high risk is it is in fact a terrible thought so essentially um you know lawrence how do you mitigate the i'll say the scam the scaremongering really because yeah when you look at the cbd there is that component um yeah. and this is let's say let's not bring in the maboneng because i that's a very separate conversation altogether so mm. let's not bring in the maboneng factor but when you just look at investing in the cbd your heel brow yovel barrier area um, you know, in Joburg, I know Durban also has, I think, an area called Berea, but even their CBT area, we typically mm. don't think of them as places we should be going into to invest. So how do you almost mitigate your fear um, when it comes to the risks um, that people mm. typically point out about those specific areas? Definitely. Well, I think, uh, and Desiree, thanks for the comment and the question. It's always about balancing risk and reward. Yes, yeah, so a higher risk means that you need to have a higher reward. And if the return justifies it, I'm willing to take the risk in Berea. Now, when you're looking in Berea, for instance, I will always use a number of provisions. So the first provision that I will use is a maintenance provision. So I will take at least 5 to 10% of the rent that I receive every month, and I'll put that away into a separate bank account, which is just for maintenance costs. So when I need to replace the geese, the repaint, when the tenant leaves and needs a bit, a bit of renovation. The second provision is a, is a vacancy or a void provision. So again, in the Berea area, I would recommend between 8 and 12% of your rent goes into a separate bank account every month, which then covers you when your property is empty or if you have to deal with an eviction and you've got one or two months where the property is not um, tenanted. And then the third thing that I would recommend is always have a six-month emergency fund, whatever business you're in. Be it, a, you know, if you're a wedding planner or, or a, a gene seller, you need to have six months worth of savings because I think COVID has shown us that no matter how strong your business is, um, and, and maybe one of the reasons why during COVID my portfolio was able to sustain during that, that time was because I had the six months of runway, which just allowed me to manage my cash flow during the hard time. So I think if you've got those two provisions and you've got your six months savings, you should be safe in an area like Berea. Of course, one last thing, sorry. Um, when you're investing in Berea, make sure you get a bank loan because what the bank does is the bank will go and vet the building that you're investing in. So they'll make sure that the building is insured, that the trustees are on top of things, that the financials look good. Um, if the bank doesn't want to lend on the block, I would say walk away because the bank's obviously got the, the analysis of, of that block. If the bank is willing to loan at it and you've run your numbers and the return is good, I would say it's worth the risk. And that's such a such an important one uh, there, Lawrence. I see a lot of comments uh, and questions from our viewers at home. Uh, Shakong Shakong saying, when I think of investing in the CBD, I get the same feeling I get when on one of the Gold Reef City rides. I'm sure it's been very interesting, <laughs> But as 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 Lawrence is saying, you know, you want to do your due diligence, put in the you know systems in place so that should anything go wrong, you know that you are sorted. So it really is just about understanding the risk as opposed to going in there thinking there's going to be no risk. And when those that risk essentially presents itself, you know, shocked. But when you go in it knowing that, look, here are some of the things that you're going to be facing. It makes it so much better. If anything, it reminds me of, of hiking. So I'm an avid hiker. I hike almost every weekend. Mm. Nice. Oftentimes when you're, you know, going and let's say conquering a slightly big mountain, you, I, I simply read up a little bit about it, read about the terrain. So mm. I'm mentally prepared with what I'm about to face. So when I do then, you know, reach that particular area where they said, look, by the time you're here, you're going to see flames. I'm not as shocked, but I still go into it mm. because uh, it's something that I want to do. So understand the risk, run your numbers, and I, hopefully it should feel 
um, a bit yeah. better. People can also go check out my, my YouTube channel. I put a lot of free educational content there and I, I do some live deal analysis of Berea and, and you'll see the view at the top of the mountain for the risk that you're taking there is worth it in my mind. Yeah. And we've got a question here from uh, Delano Skoltz who asks, uh, please assist, uh, what will be the best strategy to follow? I'm busy buying my first property, which I want to rent out. Should I use that rent income to apply for another home loan and buy another property? Or should I use it to pay off my home loan faster? I um, hope you understand. I certainly understand the question. So using the additional um, you know, rental to pay off faster or essentially using it to um, get the next home loan. Yeah, so I, I talk about this principle called infinite bank lending. Now, that when the banks lend to us as consumers, they lend on our affordability, i.e. our salary. Can our salary pay off the bond? Now, what most people do is they buy a property where the rent is less than their expenses, so they have to take some of their salary and put it into the property deal, reducing their affordability. But if you focus on buy-to-let or multi-let properties that bring a positive cash flow, i.e. positive profit at the end of the month, it adds to your affordability, and you end up getting infinite lending from the bank, because every property you add to your portfolio adds to your salary, adds to your affordability, and the bank sees you as a more bondable person. So my advice would be, um, if you've got a, another property investment, rather go for that. Um, but if you don't have another property investment, try pay off your loan as quick as possible. So it depends if you've got a, if you've got a deal that's bringing in a good return, go for it, but, um, otherwise pay off your, your existing loan. Mm. I think the, I mean, the beauty, if you choose the latter, which is paying off your existing loan is the more money you're able to put in, you probably have an excess bond in the event where then that deal that's really great presents itself. You're able to tap into this fund. Uh, you're able to leverage off of it. The banks love it when we pay our, you know, our home loans mm. kind of quicker. You're able to say to them, well, I've been paying quite well and extra for the past couple of months. And you're able to essentially negotiate for uh, more money. I see a comment, I think, here from Beniwe Sikakane. And it is, so when the questions are on my screen, they're very small. So they say, I'd like uh, clarity on rent to rent. I have an interest there since I can't buy at the moment. So just break down, Lawrence. I mean, I understand the concept, but let's break it down, you know, to viewers at home when you say rent to rent, um, almost like the elevator pitch of rent to rent and how you would probably, uh, you know, structure that particular deal. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So you need to find a house that you can multi-let. That's the key thing about the strategy. Now, when I say multi-let, it means you can put multiple people, individuals into one property. So if you can buy a five bedroom or rent a five bedroom house from a landlord and you're able to sublet that to five professionals, five students, that's where you're going to get enough leverage to make cash flow. So you've got to be able to rent from the landlord at let's call it 5,000 Rand, but then you have to sublet to the remaining tenants at a higher rate. And the difference between what you can sublet it for versus what you're currently renting it for becomes your cash flow, becomes your income. Now, the challenge with this one is you have to obviously, number one, let your landlord know that you will be subletting their property, um, which might be a bit of a challenge because the landlord will say, well, you're making money off me, I'm just gonna do it myself. And number two, you need to have at least two to three months deposits put down so if the rent is 5,000 Rand, you'll need at least 15,000 Rand to secure that deal um, and begin generating um, an income. So it's not a completely zero money deal, but it's a great way to get into property rentals without getting a loan or having any money to put down. Yeah. And I think, and I like the example that you actually, you know, made earlier on, Lawrence, uh, when you're looking at student accommodation, and this is where it typically will work out quite nicely, because you do tend to find that some property investors who go into student accommodation uh, probably went into it very enthusiastic and all fired up. And maybe they're now on like their second, third or fourth year, and they're mm -hmm. low key over it. Um, certainly the management of it, because you're dealing with, let's say, in your particular property, perhaps you're dealing with five plus students, you know, different people essentially paying you rent, their parents are paying rent, having to do statements and all these things. And so on a rent to rent deal, you're able to, let's say, in the you know example that Lawrence had shared earlier, you're getting that five bedroom house, perhaps the landlord in, in their frustration with dealing with multiple tenants, ended up making each bedroom a single bedroom when you are actually able to, let's say, still make it a double bedroom, right? So when 
when you are then looking at their interrange, you realize that maybe they had those five students and maybe he was charging, let's say, 2,000 rands rent. Um, so he was only making 10,000. You're thinking, well, I think I can probably get better returns if I, you know, jack up the rental or make the single units into a double unit and maybe still charge similar or you charge 1.9 but it's now double uh so it's two people in a room so it, it really is about looking at the properties running your numbers a bit understanding the area that you're in i mean certainly the numbers i was throwing out is for example in the Joburg area you'll find that student accommodation in the durban area the bloemfontein area the price points are a bit different so really you want to do your research you want to find those uh landlords who already bought the properties but probably just are no longer interested in the day-to-day -day management because student accommodation can be quite a handful. Uh, I think dealing with students <laughs> is a lot. Uh, I speak from experience. So I think it just depends where you are and if that's your kind of, um, if that's the road you want to walk down. Um, I do hope that it does answer you there. And, it, and, and I think Lawrence was saying, you know, it, it certainly is a great way if you've already even maxed out your affordability, but you're still looking to make extra income uh, to supplement your income and to potentially even grow your portfolio. Uh, we've got uh, Khubudi Khubudi saying, brilliant question. Uh, what would be great to get an answer? How legal is that concept? What are the risks? So that's essentially the concept of rent to rent. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the, the key thing here is you have to make sure that the landlord is aware that you are subletting. So in your contract or in your lease agreements with your, your, your tenant, your landlord needs to have full visibility on that. Um, and as long as your landlord buys into it and you've signed the right you know, legal documents with a, a good legal vetted uh, you know, uh, representative, obviously, please, guys, always use the power team um, because they're specialists in their own right. So get a good legal representation. But it is 100% legal as long as the landlord knows about it. That's perfect. Lawrence, before I let you go this evening, any final tips for viewers at home who are looking to grow their property portfolios, uh, especially right now? I mean, we're finding ourselves in, in the times of COVID. We've got historically low interest rates. Some people are getting interested in property, even though it wasn't a thing that they necessarily thought about. So even just understanding how you should be thinking through uh, this asset class, uh, whether it's an opportunity or it's too risky, because we know the interest rates are going to, to go up. 100%. I think uh, uh, my, my first principle stands true here. I think it's all about education. Um, there's some wonderful books that I could recommend. One of them is called Money Master from Tony Robbins. Brilliant. You've got uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, maybe some self-proclamation. Uh, Financial Freedom Through Property is my book. It just talks about my experience in the South African property market. Go check out YouTube. There's lots of great content out there. That, that honestly would be my recommendation. Property is an expensive asset. And if you don't exactly know what you're doing and you buy a liability, it's an expensive, costly liability that takes you back in your financial dreams as opposed to forward. So my final tip is really just to just to educate yourself. And please reach out to me on Facebook or, or whatever. I'm happy to help. Uh, obviously, my time gets to a point where I'm, I'll have to charge you or, you know, it gets to that conversation every time. But I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Um, Got lots of free content on my YouTube channel as well, so I'm, 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 I really just hope that you get yourself educated. That's that's my last tip. And I think that I'll, I'll also do a shameless plug, of course, of the Property Guide, which is a book by pro Private Property that's also very useful in terms of understanding various things within property. And it is for your renter, seller, investor. Um, it really is for everybody in the property space and understanding what are some of the key things that you need to be mindful of along your property journey. Lawrence, it's been such a pleasure to have you this evening. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. sure we'll definitely be reaching out to you again uh, to have you back on the Private Property podcast awesome thanks thanks everyone cheers and that and that is lawrence bull who's a property coach and author and the founder of my property app and i do hope that this been this has been an insightful one i think so many of us are you know want to learn different principles different tips different tricks that we're able to use along our property journey and that will really serve us well in making sure that we build our property businesses as efficiently as possible of course we always keep the conversation going down here do let us know of some of the resources that you have used uh, on the private uh, property social media platform so whether you're watching us on youtube you're watching us on facebook do comment down below we want 
to hear from you. And of course, we will, uh, you know, certainly share with the community some of those great insightful, um, you know, resources that you use at home. Well, that's it from me, Zamantunga Kumalo, and the team. It has been a pleasure to be with you. We're back again, of course, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. It is a Wednesday, so we're going to be speaking to APSA. But of course, until then, as usual, hoping you're staying home and staying safe. I'm Clinton Banfield. Our family and I live in Cape Town on the western seaboard. To be able to wake up and take in the scenery every day is an absolute pleasure. We probably have the best views of Table Mountain. There's some really amazing suburbs in our neighborhood. There's Milnerton, which is a central hub close to the city. There's some beautiful homes situated along the canal which give you a breathtaking view of Table Mountain. A little bit further along the canal, you'll find Milnerton Golf Club, which is a great place to unwind with your mates. Then we have Bloberg, which is world-renowned for its beaches, where you'll often see kite surfers taking full advantage of the wind. To top it off, there's a great variety of family restaurants in the area like Blue Peter, where people love to meet. The Bayside Mall is a landmark in Tableview, giving you an all-round retail experience in a relaxed and convenient environment. As a family, we've chosen to live in Atlantic Beach Golf Estate in Malkbore Strand. Our suburb is so chilled, it really gives you this constant holiday feel. We've lived here for two years and we've really enjoyed the laid-back lifestyle and this is our neighbourhood. <laughs>